Hi. This episode begins with uh, some great advice from Jeff Bezos and probably one of the most effective leadership principles at Amazon that his leaders are right a lot and uh, continues with some uh, other great pieces of advice from leaders from uh, Nike and um, probably also interesting to note would be uh, the advice of John Chambers as to how to make how to take risk and advice on when to take risk especially this is the one that often catches people a little by surprise um, because one of our leadership principles is that good leaders are right a lot and um, it sounds kind of like well not great but is there some way that I can practice being right a lot and you're not going to be right all the time, but I do think you, with practice, you can be right more often. And I've observed people who are right a lot, and I notice a few things about them. The first is that people who are right a lot, they listen a lot. And people who are right a lot change their mind a lot. And uh, people who are right a lot, they seek to disconfirm their most profoundly held convictions, which is very unnatural for humans. So humans mostly, as we go about life, we're very selective in the evidence that we let seep into us. And we like to observe the evidence that confirms our pre-existing beliefs. And people who are right a lot work very hard to do that unnatural thing of trying to disconfirm their beliefs. Uh, and by the way, changing your mind a lot is so important. You should never let anybody trap you with anything you've said in the past. Because that is uh, just a, you know, uh, it, it, life is complicated, the world is complicated, and sometimes you get new data. And when you get new data, you should change your mind. By the way, sometimes you don't get new data, and you just reanalyze the situation, and you realize it's more complicated than you initially thought it was, and you change your mind. This is uh, something, you know, uh, it's frustrating to watch, and I will not get into politics here tonight, but it's frustrating to watch politicians because they're almost not allowed to change their mind. As soon as they change their mind, they get accused of being flip-floppers. When reality is, anybody who doesn't change their mind a lot is dramatically underestimating the complexity of the world that we live in. The other thing is, there's a ton of academic research which demonstrates that if you connect people's work to something meaningful, they actually work harder, and they're happier, and they're more productive, and we can talk about that. Um, and it also turns out you can connect almost any work to meaning, right? So there was an article in the New York Times three years ago about a guy who works at um, Russ and Daughters, the deli out here, some of you know. Um, and his name is uh, Chapta Shinasa Sherpa. And this is the guy's story. He's been working there slicing locks for the past 10 years, right? Or 12 years now, that's his whole job. You come in, I want a pound of locks, he's your guy. And prior to doing that, his name is Sherpa because he was born in Tibet. And his job was, from the age of 11, was to pick up stuff and schlep it up Mount Everest as a Sherpa, right? And then eventually he comes to the United States. So this journalist is like, how do you feel about your work? He's like, it's incredibly inspiring and meaningful. And the journalist is like, <laughs> you sell people climb Everest, right? Like this huge thing, you slice fish. Like it's, how is this possible? And he said, in both cases, I was serving other people. You really want, think for a minute, uh, you know, if you're going to get married, uh, and you want a marriage that's going to last, not necessarily the happiest marriage, you know, or one that, that uh, Martha Stewart will talk about or anything, but you want a marriage that's going to last. What quality do you look for in a spouse? One quality. Do you look for brains? Do you look for humor? Do you look for character? Do you look for beauty? No. You look for low expectations. I mean, you know, that, is, that is the marriage that's going to last. You know. Both have low expectations. I mean, it, uh, uh, and I want my partners to be on the low side on expectations coming in because I want the marriage to last. It's a financial marriage when they join me at Berkshire. And I, I don't want them to think I'm going to do things that I'm, I'm not going to do. So that's, uh, that's our guiding principle. To, of course, if you then come up with a new medicine like Havastin, 
you won't be short of people who want to celebrate this success. And that's okay, that's fine, we should celebrate such successes. But the reality, of course, in our industry is that over 90% of the projects fail. So the norm is failure. And I think, therefore, it is extremely important. If you want to thrive innovation, if you want people to take risks, it is very, very important that leaders recognize the good work which is done. And I personally, you know, over lunch or whatever, I call up some of the project members and then we discuss the project, we discuss why it has failed, uh, we discuss what we can learn from it. And then, you know, sometimes what I do is I open a bottle of champagne and we officially celebrate the failure. <laughs> and it has an enormous impact, because if you do things like that as a CEO, especially if you take a photo which is then distributed everywhere, <laughs> then, then, you know, the, the indirect message is the important thing. Because what people realize, it is okay to fail, you know. It's appreciated that we take risks. It's appreciated that people have the courage to try out new things, which more often than not will eventually uh, fail. Um, you paid $35 for that? Yeah, it was a graphic art student at Portland State who needed money. Okay. And uh, we said, we'll pay you $2 an hour to practice, you know, to get some designs, and she spent 17 and a half hours on that. Wow, okay, well, so uh, $35, that's pretty good, okay. So, um, it right. did have a happy ending, I hope you had that. that you gave her some stock. When we went public, uh, we gave her 500 shares of stock, and she has not sold a single share, and it's over a million dollars now. Wow, it's pretty good. Now, one of the things that your, your uh, SAS is famous for is its corporate culture. Um, I think that uh, many of us um, read about you and read about your 4% turnover, read about your uh, beautiful corporate campus in Cary, and it kind of reminds uh, some of us who uh, know the history of Silicon Valley about Hewlett Packard in its benevolent um, days under Dave and Bill in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you yourself kind of cast this figure like, like David Packard. Uh, what, what um, I want to talk about, how did you settle on that idea uh, as a philosophy and how, is, how does an idea like that stand up during a tough economic time? Well, I think the idea comes from the fact that we were one of the very first knowledge companies that started back in 76. Uh, when we first left, the, the four of us that left were all uh, owners, so uh, it made a lot of sense that we should, uh, uh, you know, let the company pay for soft drinks and Cokes and things like that. And uh, then as we began to add more employees, we just continued that, that, those kind of practices. Um, but knowledge people, you know, everything that, everything that we create at SAS comes out of people's minds. There's not really much manufacturing at all. And I mean, right now there's almost no manufacturing because we try to electronically distribute everything. So it's all people's, what they have in their heads. And, and it, you have to have an environment that encourages people to have their, you know, to be creative. Uh, so, you know, we, we try to have really, you know, private offices for everybody, none of these uh, cubicle things so, so that you know, if you're in there watching porno, you, you've got your privacy, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, and, and I think it leads to, to more creativity uh, to, 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 do, to do that. Now, of course, once you put everybody in their own private offices, then you end up with a lot of blank holes. Solution, put art on it. So we have, I think, over, there's almost 6,000 pieces of corporate art now uh, around the world that, because we believe in that the art uh, adds to the creative juices that, that, you know, that are flowing in people. Again, one of the good things about getting this job is people gave me tons of advice, and some of it's actually really good advice, so I can pass it on. Uh, so some, somebody said after I got the job, they said, you know, you really have to think about leadership in three different dimensions. And most people think about leadership as the people who report to them, and they think, I lead the people who work for me. And you kind of get that. That's what 
Certainly, that's what I was thinking about. I, I lead this organization. So no, actually, leadership is across three different dimensions. You lead the people you, you know, that report to you, but you lead your peers, and you need to be intentional about how you lead your peers, because it's important to be able to lead your peers. Then you go, okay, I kind of get that. That's, that's an interesting thought. The third one, though, was the one I really hadn't thought about, which said, you lead your boss. You lead your boss. Now, you don't tend to think about that, uh, but it was worthwhile for me thinking about because I've got eight bosses, so you know, how do you lead them? I've got a couple of people here from my staff who lead me very effectively. Uh, and, and it is a skill. Uh, what you'd say is, um, Look, some people you can go in and say, you're a moron, change your mind. And other people, if you did that, you're out of a job. So you got to go, what works with this person? You actually have to think about, how do I get this person to do what you in your You're going to know your job better than your boss does. Just start there. After two weeks, you're going to know your job better than your boss, right? And your boss is going to tell you to do things that you're going to go bone dumb, doesn't make any sense, don't want to do it. And you've got to figure out, your job is figuring out how you communicate that and how you get your boss going in a more positive direction. And what I'd say is it sounds interesting and easy. That's a tough, that's tough. And it is leadership. So. Uh, the, what I would say is think intentionally about that. You know, when you're driving home at night and you get some spare time, say, who is this person that I'm working for? And how, how do I influence him or her? What, what's that influence? Because he or she doesn't want to do stupid things. They're just, you know, they just don't know the job <laughs> as well as you do. That um, if, if you're creating a company or if you're joining a company, uh, the most important thing is to, uh, attra is to attract great people. So either be with, join a group that's amazing that you really respect, or if, you, if you're building a company, you've got to gather great people. I mean, all a company is is a group of people that have gathered together to create a product or service. And so depending upon how talented and hardworking that group is and the degree to which they are focused uh, cohesively in, in a good direction, that will determine the success of the company. So. Do everything you can to, to gather great people uh, if, if you're creating a company. Um. Take risks. Do not be afraid to fail. That was the key thing I learned in Silicon Valley. If you go through life, much like playing basketball back on your heels, your opposition blows right around you. Have the courage to take those risks. Have the courage to look at the person that you're in love with and say, I'm committed to you. I want to get married. Have the courage to take that job that you were hesitant about doing. I see a lot of heads going like this, no way. <laughs> Have the courage to take that job you were hesitant about doing. Do not sell short your dreams and aspirations. In Silicon Valley, it's the red badge of courage for teams to get knocked on their tail. It's the ones that get knocked on their tail and get up that really make a difference. So one great person equals three good people. Uh, that's an understatement. You're, you're 45 times as good at a lot of things as I am and vice versa. It's a simple little statement, one equals three. We believe in only hiring great people. We'll interview you to death, have you talk to eight people. Some people leave before the interview process because it's so exhaustive, but we just think the most important thing in the world is who we hire to help us achieve what we're trying to achieve. And talent is the whole ball game. And one great person in business productivity can easily do the business productivity of one good one. And um, people want to work with great people. Do you want to go work at a place where there's a bunch of mediocrity and people are not engaged? And, and you want to work with fabulous people that you're so excited to get to work with. Um, that girl in the fifth grade that liked you and you couldn't believe she liked you because she was the coolest girl in the whole school and she liked you. I mean, you, you just couldn't believe it. I mean, it makes you want to Come to work, come to school in the morning, you know? I mean, it's, that's who you want to work with, these people you just love and admire. And so one great equal to three good, you can pay them better. We pay 50 to 100% above industry average. 
And I'm not an advocate of paying mediocre people well, but I'm a huge advocate of paying great people well. And so uh, the business wins because it's getting three times the productivity at only 50 to 100% more payroll. The employee wins because she's getting paid, say, 50% more than somebody else might pay her. And the customer wins because the customer is getting this great one equals three you know, person you know, to, uh, to work with.